the, the title of the sermon today is Vehicles of God's Grace. And the scripture reading is, is from Ephesians 4, 25 to Ephesians 5, verse 2. And the scripture reading will be done by Fred Horn today. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. These are the loving words of God. Help us to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Amen. Amen. You know, God is a very graceful God. God the Father, of course, demonstrated his love by sending his son Jesus to the earth, not to condemn the world, but to save the world, all those who would put their trust in him, in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came to the earth as the true light, which, enlighten, which enlightens everyone, he lived in the world, and even if the world was made through him, yet he was not recognized. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, came to his own, the Apostle John wrote. He came to his creation, and yet his creation, his own people, did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of, the, of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And he, Jesus, came to the earth to reveal who God is, amongst other things. And the world at the time did not recognize who Jesus was. And the same is true today, isn't it? When the majority of the world does not realize who Jesus is, they may have heard the name, but they do not know him. And, and, and when Jesus was on the earth and through his ministry, men were so angered because of who he represented and what he said that they put him to death as a blasphemer and as a common criminal. And, and as we receive Jesus in our life, we begin to live in a reality of a new creation as the beloved children of God. And Jesus, just as the world did not know Jesus, did not recognize him when he came to the earth, the world still doesn't know who the children of God are. And it's very clear in 1 John 3, 1 to 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. That, which, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. 
and we need to let those words sink in. We are children of God, and so we are. And the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, again, as children of God, and we need to let those words sink in, we are beloved. We are God's children now, not in the future, now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who does hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. No, we know God loves everyone. His grace is for everyone. And as we remember the familiar scripture of John 3, 16 to 17, that God so loved the world, that he sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through him, the world might be saved. And, and our identity has been revealed to us. We are children of God now. And people in the world do not know our identity because they do not know God yet. And they do not know their identity, not knowing God. And we, as we read in these scriptures, we realize that we have a wonderful future ahead of us. We have the assurance when Jesus appears that we will be like him. And as the apostle John writes so clearly, no one who, who denies the son has the father. Whoever confesses the son has the father. As we confess Jesus, we also have the father. And of course, we have the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And the world does not know this yet because they are blinded by the God of this world. And they are blinded to the glorious hope of the gospel promise in Jesus Christ. And we are presently on a journey, on a journey of transformation by the Holy Spirit. And in the obedience of faith, we are being molded to be like the perfect man, Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And just as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, what yet, are one yet distinct, we will always be distinct from one another. In the future of the kingdom, in the fullness of the kingdom, we will know one another. We will know, we know that we preserve our identity because the book of Revelation tells us that God will, get, will, be, will give us new names. And when we have a name, we have an identity. So God is never going to take away our identity. He's going to embellish it. He's going to, as he's making us into new creations. And being molded in the likeness of the man Jesus by the Holy Spirit, it means that this new journey, that in this new life, we have been given a new outlook, which produces new demeanors, if you will, new behaviors. Because this new life changes everything. We are being transformed by God as we take part and participate in his work in our life. And what we're going to consider today in Ephesians 4 and the first two verses of chapter 5 in Ephesians is about this new life. What God tells us about this new life. And as we consider these verses, we all need to remember that it is God who works in us, both to will and to work of his good pleasure. In Philippians 2.13, he works in us both his will, to will, and to work of his good pleasure. He doesn't force us. He does not coerce us. But as we participate in him, he does these things in us. Because God never removes free choice. He never removes that freedom. We can still resist God's will, or we can submit to his will in faith as little children trust in their parents. And as the author of the book of Hebrews confidently and hopefully wrote, says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. 
So this is the hope that every one of us here today will just stay faithful to Jesus, knowing that we do not save ourselves, God saves us. We, we will not shrink back was the hope of the Hebrew of the author of Hebrew because why? Because we are God's beloved children. He loves us more than we can ever know. So what is the context of this verse? But that is not the way you have learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful de desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we are to put off the old self, which belongs to our former way of life. And we are to be renewed in spirit in our minds. And we are, by our participation is that we are to put on this new self, which is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness. So we need to, we're talking about this old self, the old self has died with Jesus at the cross. However, it still lingers on. Still, sin and death have been defeated at the cross, yet sin and physical death still linger on, although they are defeated. And the end of sin and death will happen when Jesus delivers the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is dead in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26. So the old self still hangs on. And our participation in Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, is not to indulge in its corrupt desires. We need to leave the old way of life and put on the new life. This is our, this is our, uh, our participation. So because the old self is dead, it has no future. And it has a mixture of good and evil. And this old self can be very heroic. My wife and I last night have begun watching a film entitled Waiting for Anya. It's this tr true story of a, a widow and her son-in-law smuggling Jewish children from, from southern France to Spain during the Second World War to avoid their extermination. And it's a story of courage of daring, of sacrifice. And it's sometimes, it's hard to see and accept that the old self is in fact dead, as the Bible says. Because as we look at the world, there are people that are so capable, doctors and scientists and uh, athletes, and as we see in the Olympics, uh, gifted people in so many ways. And it's hard to accept that without God, that old nature has been crucified at the cross. And the old nature can do some good. And it also does something that it, and, and it tries to work independently from God. And it's important to, good works can never save anybody. Being nice can never save anybody. Being very capable does not save anybody. Good works do not undo sin. And good works do not meet God's righteousness. And we need to receive God's righteousness by trusting in Jesus. And the only way to be able to have eternal life is to place our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the perfect man who lived in our flesh and who never sinned, who never deviated from the will of God, of God the Father. It is only by trusting in him 
that we can have eternal life because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And since the old self is dead, God in his grace has given us a new life, a new life hidden in Christ. It is this new life that we must accept. And this new life is Christ himself. As we read in Colossians 3, 1 to 4, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So Christ is our life. We need to trust him, not trust in the old self, which is a mixture of good and evil, but that old self functioning independent from God has died at the cross with Jesus. And our new self was resurrected with Jesus at, at, the cross, at, at his resurrection. So we need to receive that new life. And you will notice that this new life is not something we create. It is created by God after his likeness, after his likeness in, true, in true righteousness and holiness. And I realize preaching on this topic is challenging because it involves putting on the whole armor of Christ, putting on Christ. And oftentimes as people, we like to hear of prophecies and we like to hear of miracles and all of that, but that are visible. But yet, this new life is the greatest miracle there is because Christ becomes our life. And the Bible talks a lot about this miracle. And as human beings, we have difficulty seeing that apart from Jesus, we are dead. We have a tendency to live independently from God, thinking that our good works are and our perceived unconverted self is good enough. And it's difficult to accept its deadness, that a new life must be received, that, it, that our new life is hidden in Christ, that our life must be, that this new life must be accepted in faith. And this new life, we will only see, only see the fullness of it and the, the complete beauty of it at the resurrection. And as we read what the Apostle Paul write, writes here, these are not suggestions. They are a way of being. As we are being renewed by the spirit in the spirit of our minds. And this renewal of our minds will consequently touch our relationship with our Lord. And our relationship with one another, both in and outside the church. Because we are to be the same way with people, both in and outside the church. But the focus here is on the church because Paul is writing about the fact that the hostility between Gentiles and the Jews have been, has been completely demolished. And in fact, in Christ, no wall, no wall exists anymore. So putting on this new self is so different than the functioning of the old self. We realize that we cannot do anything on our own, that we are completely dependent on God. And as we read these verses, we can easily rationalize that the way of God is not possible in certain circumstances. But the way of God leads to life. The way of the flesh leads to death. The following proverb has it right. It says, there is a way that seems right to man, but, it sends, but, it's, but its end is the way to death in Proverbs 14, 12. So as we follow the way of Christ, with Christ living in us by the Holy Spirit, as we imitate him, we will be able, we will, and as we abide in him and in his word, and in his person, as he abides in us and we in him, 
We experience freedom both in the church and in ourselves, even if there's opposition. It's always important to remember that putting on the new self is receiving the grace of God as we participate and let the grace of God be manifested in our life. It says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So what does it look like to speak the truth with our neighbor? Well, when anger, when, ang when angry, we are not to sin. We are not to linger in anger to avoid giving an opportunity to the devil. Theft is to, let, is to be left behind. It is selfish. Instead, we are to work to have the opportunity to help those in need when required. We need to control what comes out of our mouth. We cannot just say anything. Adjusted to each occasion, our words are to build up so that it may give grace for those who hear. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit who has sealed us for the day of redemption. Bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, slander must be put away as well as malice so this is the context of verse 25 and we live in a world where there's are many lies and we are in living in christ because christ is the truth and his life is manifested in us we are to live genuine truthful life and so let's look at each of these very quickly we won't have time to look at very deeply in all of them but the apostle paul doesn't just names them because they are so obvious and uh, many many books have been written but we'll just stick briefly and get an overview of what god says today when angry we are not to sin we are not to linger in anger to avoid giving an opportunity to the devil and Anger, we, all, we have all experienced and still experience anger from time to time. And anger in itself is not a sin. It is a human emotion given to us by God. We have the example of Jesus who expressed anger and he did not sin. He acted boldly when he drove out the money changers out of the temple. He overturned their tables and he said, take these things away. Do not Make my father's house a house of trade in John 2.16. And anger is a strong feeling, a strong emotion we, which needs to be controlled. And we cannot blame others for our anger. Because where does anger come from? Well, it comes from inside us. God is telling us not to fuel that anger by lingering and magnifying whatever triggered us. And the triggers of anger may be circumstances, it may be our thinking, it may be triggered by other people, and more often by people whom, that are close to us, people we love, and with whom we are in close relationship. And when we are angry, we are not to violate God's will. We are not to sin. We are to deal with our anger quickly by bringing our concern first to God to receive his help in dealing with this intense emotion. And if appropriate, when we can't overlook the offense, we are to try to work out the conflict with the other person or persons as we are instructed in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. We want to get anger under control as soon as possible, not to, to not give the opportunity to the devil to influence us and to make things worse. We want to be receptive to God as we are led by the Holy Spirit. By, by, we want to avoid being receptive to the God of this world who is he's out to destroy. He's, out to, he's a murderer. He's a liar from the, begin, from the beginning. He doesn't want to build up. But God wants, and God is telling us here, 
how we how we can manage this anger. And of course, self-control is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we, we are to call on God as we grow in maturity in Christ. Theft is to be left behind. It's selfish. Instead, we are to work to have the opportunity to help those in need when required. You know, God wants us to work at honest work so that we can share with others in need as we are able. And the Apostle Paul gave an example of, the, of this attitude in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Back then, the church in Macedonia helped the churches in Judea who were experiencing a severe drought. And these Macedonians were not rich. They were poor and yet had a deep desire to help their brethren out of love. They begged to take part in the, rel in the relief effort. They begged, as you read in God's word. They gave with joy and humility, even if they themselves were poor. They gave voluntarily according to their means and beyond their means, the Apostle Paul writes. And they gave themselves first to our Lord, and then by the will of God to the Apostle Paul and his companions, who would then bring their gifts to these needy brethren. These brethren in Macedonia were not selfish. They were willing to sacrifice for the well-being of others as they could. And this is an example of putting on the new self. And we have many opportunities to help with our financial means as, God's provi as God provides. But there are other ways as well, such as being hospitable, receiving people in our home, in our home when we are led to do so. We can give the gift of time to others by taking the time to write get well cards, just thinking of you cards, praying for you cards, or to give a simple phone call to just say, how are you? And even if we do not know our brethren well sometimes, it's an occasion to touch base and to get to know one another. Because we are all involved. We are part of one another, the Bible tells us. And these verses speak of relationship between the members in God's church, not relationship that fall only on the shoulders of the pastor. <laughs> you know, it's a responsibility of every member to be a blessing to the others. And we are all gifted in different ways. We can act in ways and we can pray to God, show us ways, show me ways that I can participate in building up your church as you lead us. And we need to control what comes out of our mouth. We cannot just say anything. Our words are to build up that it may give grace for those who hear. No corrupting talk. And the Bible speaks a lot about the power of the tongue. God is very clear that our words have the potential to build up or to destroy. The way we speak with one another is a sign of the love we have for one another. Jesus said that the world will know that we are his disciples. How? By the love we have for one another. And the way we speak with one another is evidence of that love. You know, God calls us his beloved. How encouraging is that when we talk with one another as God's beloved children, precious, precious in his arms. Because how we perceive one another makes all the difference in how we speak with one another. Because the tongue is very powerful. James, the brother of Jesus, describes the power of the tongue powerfully. And he minces no words. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Powerful, isn't it, in John, in James 1.26. And then he says later in James 3, 5 to 6, he says, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. 
how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on, on fire by hell. And we need God's help and the leading of the Holy Spirit to control our tongue. Because it can be so destructive, if not kept in check. And part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, again, is self-control. So it's not impossible as we grow and we mature in Christ. It's very, it's possible. It's going to happen as we let the Holy Spirit guide us. Because we're not able to do it alone. In James 3.8, he says, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. So Proverbs and the Apostle Peter described to us how healing the tongue can be when used in God's love, when spoken in truth. Our speech, as we are led by the Holy Spirit's grace, gives grace to those who hear us. The Apostle Paul adds, as it fits the occasion. So, you know, we need to, to use wisdom. We need to ask God for wisdom and as how to use our words, when to use our words. In Proverbs 15, 14, it says, a gentle tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. So a gentle tongue is a tree of life. God never wants us to break anybody's, anyone's spirit. That is a lie direct from hell, you know, to try to break somebody's spirit. That is not God's way. It's not biblical. Yeah, it's not what Jesus came to do. And in 1 Peter 3.10, he says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. So he, the Apostle Peter says the same thing. Keep our tongue from evil and not to deceive people with our words. That is the way. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, this is the way the, the Apostle Peter tells us to do. We are not to grieve the Holy Spirit who has sealed us for the day of redemption. This is a clear verse that the Spirit is a person because a force or a thing cannot be grieved. And when we pray about the Holy Spirit, we should not say it or we should say he, who, you know, use personal pronouns because the Holy Spirit is personal. He is the spirit of the Father and the spirit of the Son. The seal of the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about is a mark of ownership, a mark of possession, of authentication. And as we receive the word of God, who is Jesus, God is telling us that we belong. And we can respond and we should respond and we respond by saying amen to that. We belong to God. I do belong to God and I am an adopted child profoundly loved by him. That is who we are. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our salvation. We are not to grieve him. And Jesus came to the earth so that we can share in the relationship of, in his eternal relationship with God as the Father and the Holy Spirit, the triune God who is eternal. He came to share this godly love with us as the Holy Spirit now dwells in us. He wants us to participate in the eternal love of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one God. And if we resist or reject God's love, we grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve the heart of the Father and of Jesus, the heart of the one triune God. And our hope is that we will share in this wonderful relationship of, of love united to our high priest, Jesus Christ, our brother. And, we will, and it's, 
an all eternity relationship. This opportunity by God's grace is extended to all human beings. And again, he will never force or, or he will never cause or force anyone to enter in this relationship of love, but he makes it possible for everyone to say, yes, I want to belong. And God's desire is expressed in 1 Timothy 3, uh, verses 3 to 5, where it says that it's pleasing in God's sight. He desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And let's remember that Jesus is always yes. But God never takes our freedom to say yes or no to him. Hopefully, very few will say no to this awesome and incredible invitation and reality that God has given us now to those he is calling now. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and, sans, and, and slander be, caught, be put away from you with all malice. And he says, you know, from the look at the biblehub.com, it says, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, those are, clamor is a loud cry done with great emotion. Slander, it's, it's abusive, it's insulting, it's offensive, it's venomous, it's baseless, it's defamatory language. And it must be put away as well as malice, you know, the vicious disposition, the spite that, can, that does inhabit human beings. And we are to put all away, away all of that. God wants us to have a gentle, loving, kind spirit. That's what he gives us as we receive him and as we live in this new life. Summing up, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I like, I like what is said here because it's a good resume of what we just read. Make grace your space. Isn't that beautiful? That's how we imitate. That's how we are imitators of God as the life of God is manifested in our life. As his beloved children, because God's space for all of us is grace for everyone. And, and here in verse 32, acknowledges the fact that at, there are times where we, will, where we will have to forgive one another because we are not perfect in the flesh. None of us are. We all have to make choices to put off the old nature and put on the new one. And we are already forgiven by God. We were forgiven at the cross. It's not something that happened. We were forgiven before we ever knew it. We owe nothing to God because Jesus Christ has paid it all for us. And as we have said many times in the past, and then as, as the Bible repeats, Jesus has taken upon himself what we deserve by becoming sin for us, by dying in our place. And because he had no sin, sin had no power over him. And this is called by the Torrances as the great exchange. He took on our sin and its penalty, which is death, so he could give us his perfect life. There is no greater exchange than this. And it's good to think about what kindness, what being tenderhearted and forgiving one another looks like. We need to know what it is to express it in difficult situations. Because that's when it's really tested, isn't it? When there are difficult situations to be forgiving, to be tenderhearted, to be forgiving. 
when things all go right, it's not that hard. But when things heat up, that's when it shows. And, and, and we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit in those situations. And we can think of how both people inside and outside the church and how when, you know, when, they, when people are tenderhearted towards us, how do you feel? When we feel validated by others because they are forgiving, how, do you, how does that make us feel? We feel attracted to kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving people. That's the way we are. That we are programmed that way. When somebody is always hard and it's like a porcupine, you know, you say one thing and he rebuffs it and just puts you down and all of that. You know, it's hard to have a relationship with those people like that. But as God's people, we need to be forgiven, even forgiving, even in those situations. And we are responsible to be kind hearted in those situations, just like Jesus is towards us. Doesn't mean, and we have, as we saw in a past sermon, gentleness is, is a strong force. It's, it's, it takes strength to be gentle. You know, Thomas Torrance perfectly captures the love of God for us and why in him we are to be kind to one another, tender-hearted and forgiving one another. So just read this as we come to the close of the sermon. God loves you so utterly and completely that he has given himself for you in Jesus Christ, his beloved son, and has thereby pledged his very being as God for your salvation. In Jesus Christ, God has actualized his unconditional love for you in your human nature in such a once for all way that he cannot go back upon it without undoing the incarnation and the cross and thereby denying himself. Jesus Christ died for you precisely because you are sinful and utterly unworthy of him and has thereby already made you his own before and apart from your ever believing in him it's powerful we belong to him before we ever knew it because we were bought at the cross by his blood he has bound you to himself by his love in a way that he will never let you go even if you refuse him and damn yourself in hell his love will never cease Think about it. His love will never cease because that's who God is. Therefore, repent and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's from the mediation of Christ in page 94. And this is why we put on the new self every day. We are so blessed and privileged. God has called us to his church to belong to Jesus and to be a blessing to others. We live by faith and not by sight. The Apostle Peter said it so well. He said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exile to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. What a hopeful verse as we live and as we put on this new self. Let us pray.